Good afternoon and welcome to the Lake Pharma COVID Vaccine Development Seminar. My name is Tiffany Willoughby, Research Education Programs and Outreach Manager in the Office of Research at the University of Texas at Dallas. I will be your moderator. Joining me today to discuss vaccination development, production, and so much more is Dr. Hua Tu. Dr. Hua Tu, the founder and CEO of Lake Pharma, started the company in the San Francisco Bay Area in 2009. He received his academic training at State University of New York at Stony Brook and Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. After starting his biotech career as a postdoctoral fellow at Tularic, he continued to work on drug development at Tularic and Amgen. His ongoing aspiration is to help bring efficiency and scale to the life science industry. Dr. Huatu, welcome. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Tiffany. I will share my screen now. Can you see my screen? Okay, all right. Uh, thanks everybody for joining us today. I like to tell you about uh, Lake Pharma and, uh, and also I will uh, tell you about the Lake Pharma COVID vaccine development program. So the second slide is about me as introduction. So I have a bachelor degree in biochemistry um, from Stony Brook and a PhD in molecular and cell biology from Stony Brook and Cold Spring Harbor Lab. So I spent 20 years in the biotech environment for drug development. Um, right after I got my PhD, I joined a drug development company called Telaric in South San Francisco, California. I was there for six years and in 2004, Amgen acquired Telaric, so I stayed in Amgen for five more years. And uh, in 2009, I left Amgen to start Lake Pharma in the San Francisco Bay Area. And, uh, <clears throat> and I continue on uh, with Lake Pharma, currently serving as president and CEO. And about a year and a half ago, uh, we relocated to the Dallas-Fort Worth area to build site number six, uh, Lake Pharma Dallas. So that's my background. And just to tell you a little bit about Lake Pharma, we are a US-based biologic CRDMO. CRDMO stands for Contract Research Development Manufacturing Organization. So think of us as a biotech company and who work with a lot of other biotech and pharma companies. Company has six locations so far. Uh, we have three in the San Francisco Bay Area. That's in San Carlos, Belmont, and Hayward. Um, Belmont is our original site in the uh, in the Bay Area and still has our old logo on the building. The company also has two sites outside of Boston, uh, one in Worcester, and which is actually on campus of uh, Worcester Polytech Institute. And we've been there since 2003. And the reason we've been there um, that long is it was actually a different company that uh, is called Blue Sky Biotech that Lake Pharma acquired about four and a half years ago. And uh, Hopkinton facility uh, that's just outside of Boston. Uh, we're about a few blocks away from the starting line of the Boston Marathon. And then in Dallas, Fort Worth area, we have an operation in Irving and right outside of the uh, DFW airport. So that's where I am right now. We currently have 30 people uh, in this facility. So today I'll talk about a few things. I want to provide a brief overview on biologic drug development, very high level. Then I will uh, um, tell you about our COVID vaccine development program. And in closing, I will share with you how uh, we'd like to collaborate with uh, academic institutions. So th those are the three segments. And I tried to have my talk at high level um, to give uh, folks a broad view on things. This slide um, highlights the pathway to make a protein drug. Um, when we think about a protein drug, um, 
So what is a protein drug? There's actually a lot of protein drugs out there. Insulin is a protein drug. Okay, so when when you think about protein drug, you can think about something like an insulin or a growth hormone or some oncology antibody drug. They generally are injectables. So that's a brief introduction on protein drug. And in terms of making a, a drug product, you always start with an idea and then we get to a lead molecule. And then there's a significant amount of work that needs to be done in the development of such lead molecule that will lead to a product. Uh, product something that can be used um, uh, in, in patients and do something good. So there are several aspects of this. So when we think about a product, and there are two things that are critical. One is make sure product is efficacious. Make sure it's doing something good and useful. Second is make sure product is safe. Um, those are the two most important thing when we look at a product development. But there are other elements as well, and I would say reliable is important. You want to have a product that can be reliably manufactured and the activity and potency stayed constant so that uh, to really be useful. And the fourth point is be relevant. And a product need to be relevant in terms of the time it takes to develop, perhaps the COVID vaccine, the time factor is important. And, and so is the cost as well as the usability and time, cost and usability, is something I will touch on in my COVID vaccine development topics. So those are the, the parameters to look at, and we can also look at um, a product development. There's several aspects of it. That's on the purple area on the right, and everything starts with biology and pharmacology. Pharmacology is the study and make sure to, to evaluate if a product is useful. Does it have the right pharmacology? Does it have the right PK, the right efficacy? Also, we um, look at the potential of toxicology. There's actually a significant amount of work spent in the toxico toxicology area to ensure a product is safe. And then there's something called CMC. This term is used very broadly in the biotech environment, uh, but for others, what does that mean? CMC stands for Chemistry, Manufacturing and Control. It's really referring to the production of a product. And that is actually the, a very heavy area in drug development process and is one area that Lake Pharma has invested and built uh, significantly. Once you have a way to manufacture product and ensure the quality, ensure the efficacy and safety, the clinical trials are done, and that's in the clinical development space, and that's where there's the phase one, two, three trials, where the experimental drug is used in clinical trials to demonstrate the clinical safety and efficacy. And once the all the data package is generated, then there's the filing with the FDA for actual drug approval, and that's going through and being done by regulatory departments as well as the uh, post regulatory marketing departments. So this this slide is again is provide a, a high level view on the <clears throat> on the pathway to make a protein drug. So in Lake Pharma, we focus on the biology, the pharmacology, the toxicology, uh, as well as the, the CMC of things. Cu currently, Lake Pharma does not do uh, clinical trials, uh, and we don't do a lot of regulatory or marketing. So that's generally done in a much later stage. I'd like to briefly uh, uh, highlight the, the popular production platforms for a biotech product or a, a protein drug product. And for proteins, the three most popular platforms, one is the mammalian, it's called Cho Stable Saline Platform. Majority of the biotech products out there are produced using the Cho platform. And, but what's also have been used are E. coli and yeast as production platform. For example, insulin is produced in yeast and some of the growth hormone is produced in E. coli. So those are 
uh, those continue to be production platforms that are relevant. For antibodies, which is a very big domain in biotech products now, they're generally producing the CHO stable cell line platform. The past few years, we have seen uh, the, the emergence of uh, several new type of products, viral vectors, and primarily used for gene therapy and cell therapy space. The viral vectors uh, tend to be made by transient transfection of uh, mammalian cells, and HEC293 cells is a very popular platform. And uh, recently, there's also the uh, demonstration of using baculovirus platform to produce viral vectors. So uh, that, that's a, another domain. mRNA is um, a product that the industry has been working on for a long time, probably for more than 10 years. And the most recent COVID uh, vaccine development, some of those products are actually mRNA products, and those are made in the cell-free reactions. So it's a it's a different manufacturing process, but uh, it's gaining popularity. So those are the the popular production platforms, and collectively they represent better than 90 90 percent, 95 percent of the bio, biotech products out there. And Lake Pharma is actually involved in every single one of those production platform. So that's what we have. This is a, a Chevron chart, and just to drill in a little bit more, looking at the the, the domains we look at in a, a, a biotech drug product development. So those are the key steps. And from, moving from left to right, start with target biology. That is generally done by NIH funded activities, perhaps work done in U UT Dallas would be in that domain. After target biology is lead discovery and then characterization of the lead to generate the lead molecule. And then going to the blue is the optimization engineering of the lead molecule leading to uh, a good scale production of the molecule so that one can do a number of characterization studies with the lead molecule. Once that's proven to be positive, uh, we would go into the development process, development of a manufacturing process so that we can make this molecule consistently, reliably, and at scale. And once that's developed, then there's the, the, the GMP manufacturing for early phase clinical trial, and then the GMP manufacturing for late phase and commercial manufacturing. So, and Lake Pharma is in a lot of those domains. In fact, we're pretty well um, built to connect the pieces together. And just to feature, at each stage of the development process, at each step, there are key questions we, we look at. And uh, at the lead molecule characterization, we're mainly looking at the activity and potency and make sure that we're seeing the right biological effect. But then in the characterization and development process, we'll be looking at production yield, characterization of the molecule, the animal studies for efficacy and safety, and eventually building a very large and comprehensive data package for lead molecule going to manufacturing process and as well as uh, clinical data generation. So those are the key steps. What I also want to highlight is um, thinking about things in scale as well as product quality and manufacturability. So looking at the same Chevron chart, what's shown in red is the the scale of the molecule we're producing. Usually in the research, research stage, we're producing molecules in a milligram scale, but then once we get to animal studies or characterizations, we'll need gram scale of it. But when we go to the clinical trials, that's where you start to look at kilogram scale production of proteins or antibodies. All of that is to um, look at the, the product profile, product quality, consistency, so you really need to have a scalable manufacturing process that can produce things in the kilogram scale and, and do so consistently. And a big part of that is the product release criteria. We'll be looking at the same kind of product release criteria, whether we make them in a one gram scale or one kilogram scale. So, and this is a uh, pretty demanding uh, when it comes to the manufacturing process. As you can appreciate, making one gram of a protein is already um, not easy to do, and you have to when you need to do that in the kilogram scale, 
your manufacturing process has got to be reliable and it's got to be scalable. So that's what um, that's a domain we spent a lot of time do in, in Lake Pharma. So. OK, uh, that represents a, a high level overview and uh, some of this may be uh, foreign uh, for for academia um, and that's that's normal and because academia is generally involved in the target biology, the purple may be the red uh, space. We have yet found a single academic institution that can do development uh, or manufacturing further. So I, I think that's the role of the industry and therefore collaboration between academia and industry. Well, that's been uh, a domain that's been active for many years and we expect that continue to be a partnership uh, going forward. I want to go into the Lake Pharma COVID vaccine development and uh, and show you what uh, we have done and what we plan to do. COVID-19, well, you can't miss it these days, uh, is, is the number one news, number one development this year, and it's continued to be a serious problem. So COVID-19 is a disease, it's caused by the new coronavirus called SARS-CoV-2. We often just call it COVID-2. It's most related to another coronavirus called SARS, and that emerged in 2003, but then went away. Um, didn't stay for very long. I think we all got lucky that time. The COVID-2 and, COVID and, and SARS are fairly related uh, viruses. Uh, they share some sequence similarity, and then importantly, they target the same receptor called ACE2. For a virus to enter into a cell, they actually do need to interact with the cell uh, for infection and the receptor chosen by the virus uh, is ACE2. It's, um, it's a receptor in, uh, in a lot of the cells in our respiratory, respiratory system and ACE2 is the key element for cell entry. They could be other receptors, but we haven't have not been convinced that there are actually other receptors there. So you can imagine if someone who is who does not have ACE2 or has an ACE2 that cannot be targeted virus could actually be immune to, by the virus. We have seen that in the HIV case and HIV use a receptor called CCR5 for cell entry and humans who have a different CCR5 receptor actually immune to HIV infection. So the receptor is pretty well established and in fact uh, when SARS-CoV-2 happened um, the biotech community actually figured out the receptor almost instantly because of the, the past history with SARS, uh, which identified ACE2 as a receptor. So there were uh, a number of papers published very quickly in the February, March timeframe, all pinpoint ACE2 as the receptor. And the results are overwhelmingly um, clear. COVID-2, just like other coronaviruses, they are envelope virus, meaning the virus actually has a membrane, and this is also similar to HIV. The envelope virus, um, they are generally not very stable. They're not very stable, so uh, we, we do not know exactly the stability of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, but it's not the, the very stable kind because the membranes can be destroyed pretty easily. So, and this is probably why the UV lights and uh, disinfectant and ethanols probably do a pretty good job in, in activating the virus. The other kind of viruses, the, some viruses are called capsid virus. Now capsid virus are much more stable because they have a rigid exterior shell um, and that would be much harder to um, to inactivate. So SARS-CoV-2 is not that bad from a stability, um, from a disinfecting point of view. It's also an RNA virus and uh, it can mutate. It's similar, it's probably similar to HIV in that regard. So um, there's been so many publications and uh, you know, Wall Street Journal article on the virus. Uh, I think the society has actually very well versed when it comes to uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus. Now this is a new coronavirus, but 
one should appreciate that coronaviruses have been with us for a very long time. There are four identified coronaviruses that has have already been in seasonal flu. And we probably have all been exposed to at least some of those coronaviruses. So coronaviruses are not really new. This virus is, and this virus may be a bit unique in its ability to infect and cause um, cause uh, significant problems. So looking at the lower on the graphics, uh, that's a very, uh, um, that's an image of the coronavirus. And the minute th that red image is actually slightly off, I think the spike on the surface of the virus is even bigger than what's shown in those artists uh, rendering. We have seen the electrical uh, microscopy of, uh, of the coronaviruses. Um, the red, um, we call the, I call that like a broccoli shape. That's the, that's the spike protein, and that's actually even bigger than what's shown here. It's the most dominant protein on the surface of the virus. So focus on the red and zooming a bit, you see the image in the middle, which is a, a structure published by UT Austin in March. The team over there generated the, the cryo EM image of the virus really, really quickly. So very impressed by their work and to show that that's um, the structure. And what's shown in the little green space, that is the key domain called RBD, and that's the domain that does the job by attacking the ACE2 receptor on the cell surface. So that gr little green space, that is the key element in terms of attaching the virus to the cell surface for infection. And the UT Austin team further show that they there are different conformation of the RBD. There could be a up protomer structure or down protomer structure. And we believe the up protomer structure is when the virus gets activated to attack ACE2, whereas if it's in the down protomer section, it's not. Hi, you have questions in the queue, Dr. Tu. Okay. Um, the first question is, how does a production company ensure quality control in mass production of product? Yeah, I think the, the simple answer is that the two elements. One is uh, make sure we build a process that can produce the molecule in a consistent way. And how do you know it's consistent? Is you develop a number of characterization assays looking at a molecule and ensure the, the molecule or the product have the consistent profile every time. So you define a range as acceptable, and if it's outside the range, that's not acceptable, and then build it so that, um, so we don't just make the molecule and say, here it is. We will make the molecule, and we will spend a lot of time testing the molecule to ensure the consistency of it. That's one side of it. And the other side is that every production process has a very strong independent quality control, quality assurance people. They're the people who are not involved in the production of the molecule, but they, their, their job is to ensure that the quality of the molecule is, is expected. So that's actually a pretty substantial uh, organization to ensure that. So companies, all the manufacturing companies we know of in the biotech space, they each have a very substantial quality assurance department so that to demonstrate that, uh, to document as well, everything is documented to make sure that the product is, con is consistent. Thank you, Dr. Tu. Another question in the queue, from where do these coronavirus originate? Are all coronaviruses zoonotic viruses? Yeah, uh, the origin of the virus is not something we study, and uh, and there the, there are various uh, theories for that. Uh, what I believe is it occurred naturally, um, and uh, and it evolved, and uh, th there's probably been, been many coronaviruses. Um, outbreaks, but this particular one is very, very infectious and therefore causing a pandemic problem. 
and whereas certain viruses, if they're not very infective, then they don't spread and become very isolated case and it's not a global problem. So, but exactly, I think there's more research need to be done on that, on the origins of, um, of this virus and perhaps the other coronaviruses. There's really a lot of coronaviruses out there in the, uh, in the wild. And I think this one just got, uh, you know, apparently it's very infectious, so therefore it's able to spread. So there's, there's going to be more research on that, but that's not a domain we look at. So. Okay. And there are no additional questions in the queue at this time. Thank you. Okay. All right, let's move on to uh, zooming on the this COVID-2 and look at the spike protein. So when you think about COVID-2, the key word, when you look at coronavirus, the key is the spike. In fact, that's what's given the name of a corona. Okay. And that spike, when you look at that spike, think about that as a protein. So for the biology majors, in the audience, well, that's sort of that. That's where your major comes into play. Okay, that's a protein. So the spike protein is a very large trimeric protein, um, and uh, as shown on the structure on the right, is a it's a large protein, it's significantly larger than the ACE2 receptor, and the ACE2 is already not a small protein. So it's so big you could actually pick up with the electron microscope, and, and that gave the original name. So the spike protein is very large. It's actually each spike is actually a trimer, and each piece is about 300, is about 200 kilodalton. So collectively, the trimer is about 600 kilodalton. And and we have studied that. And what's shown on the SDS page on the left, that's um, lane number two. That's the SDS page of a recombinant spike protein we made. Um, and uh, it's heavily glycosylated. It's really running at about 200 kilodalton. So that's the, the spike. And on the RBD, which is a portion of the spike protein, and we produce that as a monomer, it runs about roughly 35 kilodalton, as shown on the gel in the middle of the curve. So the different, um, and we'll, we'll be talking about the immunization studies of these two protein. So again, spike protein is large, is trimeric, is about 600 kilodalton, whereas the RBD is smaller. It's the key domain that mediates interaction between the virus and the cell surface receptor. That's a much smaller protein. It's about 35 kilodalton. So, and we pay particular attention to the RBD because we believe that is the critical domain for the biology function of the virus. In, in terms of interacting with the cell surface receptor. So Lake Pharma as a company that makes a lot of protein, we actually are able to make those proteins very quickly and uh, make it uh, very pure. So how do we know if the protein is active? That is when we went to uh, ELISA format, looking at the interaction between the spike proteins and the ACE2 receptor. So we do this in the, in the cell-free system and and what we show here is the uh, the spike protein RBD. They have um, roughly three nanomolar um, EC50 when it comes to binding to ACE2. But then when we look at the full length spike protein, we see the potency is much higher, is is uh, less more, less than one nanomolar uh, of potency. And and that's actually exactly as what. Uh, we would expect. So this demonstrates the proteins we made are biologically active when it comes to the receptor targeting. We then did more characterizations, uh, this time using octad assay, which is uh, looking at the binding kinetics of the interaction. Again, uh, when you see a, a flat curve, that means the dissociation is really, really slow, indicating a strong binding. Whereas if you do the, if you see a sharp drop off, then there's a, a lower binding. What we see here is the RBDs can bind to ACE2, although the binding potency, the KDs are, um, are not very good. They do bind and they come off, whereas the spike protein, the trimeric form, has uh, shown a very, very strong binding. And this is probably why this virus is able to infect very well because it's able to target the receptor very, very tightly. Okay. 
Once we have made the protein, we have uh, done a number of immunization studies, and I want to uh, summarize the, the key elements here. When we immunize uh, animals with a spike protein, it generates good antibody titer. So that's good and that's expected. But when we immunize with the RBD alone, again, we're able to see a very good antibody titer. So again, immunize with a big spike protein, good antibody titer, small RBD, good antibody titer. So that's good. And uh, uh, this shows that the protein is actually immunogenic. It kind of make you think that producing a vaccine would not be too difficult. And we actually saw that very early. We'll probably saw this kind of results back in um, March and April timeframe. We then also show that the plasma samples from those uh, immunized animals, they not only have good antibody titer, they also have high level of antibodies that can block the interaction with spike and ACE2. So that, that's actually really important results. This is to show that you can actually generate antibodies that can do something about it. Instead of antibody, instead of just bind, it can bind in a way that would disrupt the interaction between the spike protein and ACE2. We also saw that pretty early on. And then we then tested the plasma samples in the pseudovirus neutralization assays. And that work was actually not, uh, it was done by our collaborators in University of Illinois in Chicago, a virology lab there who's been doing this for many years. And then they could easily detect the the inhibitory activity in the plasma samples immunized by uh, our proteins. We've done a large number of uh, studies. In the end, based on the data, we selected a particular version of RBD as a lead molecule for protein vaccine development. So that's the overview and the rationale why we pick RBD um, instead of the full and spike protein as the uh, immunogen for vaccine development. I want to show you some data. Uh, this slide is, is actually a really important slide. No one has done um, immunization studies the way we have because Lake Pharma has a proprietary pentamized platform and is particularly well suited for vaccine studies because we understand that the immune response is highly dependent on MHC profile and different individuals have different MHC profile. Pentamized um, is a platform that was specifically designed and built to address the different MHC profile in animals. Turns out animals, mice, are just like humans, are very, have very diverse MHC profile. So the pandemize is the most immunologically diverse set of rodents to be tested in any preclinical vaccine studies. So that's uh, something special that Lake Pharma built. And when we spoke with outside experts on this domain, a, a, a lot of people took notice of this platform that we have built and studied. And the clinical relevance of this type of pentamized platform versus a single strain platform is that the individual variance in the MHC profile actually can result in a significant difference in the vaccine response. And we have seen vaccine failures um, in the past with various molecules such as HEP-B vaccine, H1N1 vaccine, where some individuals respond very well and others don't. Even for Hep B vaccine, which is very well established now, there are certain individuals who just do not respond to that. They will be called as a failure rate because they don't respond. So therefore, it was very important for, for us to look at the vaccine response in the pentamice where multiple strains of animals are used to test. And we're looking for for vaccines that can generate adequate response, immune response across the board versus just in certain select animals. So I want to show you the data. If you look at the graphs on the up lower left, that's the day 30 ELISA binding data. By the way, the signal here would indicate uh, formation or detection of, of antibodies in the plasma. That's what you want to see with the vaccine. In this particular one, the cohort one, we see that every animal showed a good antibody titer. The only black line there, that's actually this uh, control sera we use. So those were not from our immunized study. The cohort one, we were able to see immune response in every single animals we tested in the plant of mice platform. But if you look at the cohort two, this is where you see some individuals respond very well. 
but others have marginal response or perhaps no response whatsoever. And this is again, this is the power of the Pentamize platform when we look at the different MHC. The immune response correlated with the MHC uh, profiles very, very well. So looking at the data here, and we would say this particular cohort too, this is not ideal because while we see good response in some, we're not seeing good response in all, and this will not be a good vaccine. You would, we would say the cohort one would be a good vaccine for it. The challenge here is that cohort one is immunized with a methodology that is not applicable to humans. We cannot do this thing in humans to achieve this. Okay, therefore we look for additional um, adjuvant vaccine combination to do that. And this is a lot of study, and we summarize the data in this slide, slide number 16, where we tested in Pentamize various adjuvant combinations with our protein vaccine. And we saw that uh, number uh, cohort one actually shows not only good titer, but also great ACE2 target inhibition in plasma across the board. But again, as I mentioned earlier, that technology is not applicable to humans. We cannot immunize humans using that, that technology. And if you look at cohort two, this marginal response, it doesn't work. Cohort three, we see some response, but when we saw cohort six, we we're very impressed by the data. Not only every animal we tested show a good response, the, the level of response is even better than our cohort one. Our cohort one is actually the, the gold standard. So we're very happy with cohort number six. And if you look at cohort number eight, what's shown here, some animals in cohort eight achieve very, very high level of antibody response. But the problem is some others have very marginal response. So choosing between six and eight is pretty obvious. We should choose six versus eight. Despite uh, some really high levels here, we want to see uniform performance across the board. So, because we want to get high percentage of uh, immune response in all the individuals. So, from this big comprehensive set of studies, we ultimately select cohort number six as the way to do to do vaccine. And one thing to note there at the very end, at the, on the right side, is the com human convalescent samples, and those are the the plasma samples from individuals who have been who were infected and recovered naturally from the coronavirus infection uh, from there, we could see very small level of neutralizing activity. In comparison, the our immunization studies actually achieved far better, perhaps a thousand fold better uh, immune response and neutralization antibody formation compared to human convalescent samples. So that really gave us the confidence that we have something special here. We're achieving not only very high titer, but much stronger, uh, much stronger immune response. Thank you, Dr. Sue. We have additional questions in the queue. Mm -hmm. The first one is, how can a company accelerate the batch production or production of vaccine at scale of vaccine? Also, how can the vaccine be made more potent such that it can be inhaled or nebulized instead of injecting through the bloodstream? That's great. So, uh, I'll address the second question towards the end. I actually have a slide for that. Um, in terms of how to accelerate the manufacturing, well, this is where, um, uh, this is what Lake Pharma has been working on. And I can tell you, we're already in the manufacturing of the vaccine. So, and uh, it depending on how fast an organization can move, how good the production process uh, is built and how scalable it is. It's a, it's a very broad, it's a very big topic. Um, it is definitely a challenge for the industry, particularly when it comes to the COVID vaccine. Right now, when you look at a COVID vaccine, we have a num we have several programs in phase three clinical trial and there's been a lot of attention paid on, are they gonna get approved or not? And we expect some of them will get approved, uh, maybe not too far away. Then everybody will be looking at the manufacturing and availability of such vaccines. 
because that becomes the critical. What good does it do if you can only make a few doses and that, that doesn't cover the, the population? So it will become major topics for the news channels in the next few months, provided that a vaccine gets approved. So, all right, let me, let me continue and I will address the inhalation part uh, later. Uh, by the way, the, the data I've shown you so far, everything is done by intramuscular injection, so there's no inhalation. As traditional vaccines are all done by uh, this type of uh, injection. And so are the current frontrunners there. They are all intramuscular injection as far as we know. So after showing that the cohort six combination achieved the best response, um, we then look at the, the, the time course of antibody response. And again, I'm only showing you some of the data. Uh, our immunologists uh, in California have been working really hard and generated hundreds of slides. And I'm just sharing with you some of it, maybe the some of the represent, representative slides. So looking at the time course of antibody response at day nine, we see really very small a marginal response and see better response in day 16, and we start to see fairly good response at day 23 and day 30. And the, the, the response will persist in day 52. In fact, I think the longest we've done now is about 100 days, and we continue to see antibody response. So this is kind of a normal time course for antibody response. You do not expect to develop antibodies right away. And a few months from now, when we all start to get immunized, do not expect you have protection the day of injection. It will take a few weeks for antibodies to develop. Always the case. So it's not, we may have seen the movies where people get immunized and then they will go out and behave as normal. Please don't. Uh, it takes a while for the antibody response to happen after immunization. So I would give at least two weeks, um, at least two weeks, okay? Uh, because the what the vaccines are doing is basically a trigger immune response by the body to develop uh, the, the the B cells, the T cell response, and those time those things take time to do, okay? So pay attention to that when you do get immunized. Um, I think you should, and, and generally you should wait until the antibodies are fully developed to have a level of uh, protection. Anyway, so this is again the title results. I do want to show you the pseudovirus neutralization assays um, that we have done a lot. We probably have done uh, hundreds of hundreds of samples now, if not a few thousand um, now, and this shows you that what, what it is is that this is very standard biology platform where you build pseudovirus for a particular virus and then look for the infection of the virus to a cell. So why pseudovirus? Why not use the live virus? Well, uh, number one is safety because pseudovirus, they're not exactly the same. So uh, as, a, as, a, as a live virus and therefore pseudovirus can be done in, um, in BSL, biosafety level two laboratory, whereas live virus studies generally need to be done in the BSL three or four, where, where you see that people really dressed, dressed up in full, full gear for, for live virus studies. So pseudovirus is a lot safer. It's a model system to study virus activity, but, but it cannot give people the virus. And the second thing is with pseudovirus, we get to putting reporter genes into the virus so that when the virus, when the pseudovirus infect a cell, it's much easier for us to have a readout whether that infection happened. For example, we could put a green fluorescent protein gene into pseudovirus, and if the pseudovirus infect cells, then it would turn certain cells into um, to produce green fluorescent. That's something we can easily tell if infection has happened. If you do this with a wild type live virus, you can't use that technology and you might have to look at some natural gene expression to do. So that's pseudovirus activity. We are a big fan of pseudovirus uh, studies because they allow us to 
to in, interrogate the system very thoroughly and something much more than what one can do with a live virus. What's shown here is that we took some of the plasmas from the immunized animal and then we apply them to the cell culture in which we have pseudovirus that are ready to infect cells. And we look at the ability of the plasma from those, from those animals in the ability to neutralize that virus inhibition. So if you have heard about the convalescent sample, conver convalescent plasma therapy, it's really this sort of things where the plasma from convalescent samples they have ability to block the virus uh, activity. What's shown here is that we're seeing really good titer uh, from the plasma from those animals and they're far superior than actually the human convalescent samples we have tested. So the, again, this gives us really good confidence that we're generating not only very high titer from our immunization studies, the titers, the antibodies we produce, they are functional. So, moving on, um, so here's the summary of the key data for our protein vaccine. We also call that LP151. So we have, uh, have done large number of immunogenicity studies, or think about it as the vaccine studies, so those are completed. We have done very extensive set of adjuvant combination studies completed, and those escalation studies completed, time course completed. Uh, I'm not showing any data on the T cell response side, but we demonstrated the T cell response in, a, in addition to the B cell response. And we have certain studies ongoing for the virus challenge study, and that's actually with the live virus, um, a real challenge study. We have completed non-GLP talk study, which show that our protein vaccines is very safe. We hardly saw any signal. And uh, our manufacturing process have been developed and we are actually doing the manufacturing of that right now and in anticipation of getting them ready for uh, for clinical trials. Now, we're certainly, Lake Pharma certainly is not the only one developing a COVID vaccine. It's a very, uh, it's a very big domain and we're very pleased to see that the biotech industry really got got involved and, and pushed the various platforms forward. So the number of vaccine candidates in clinical development and preclinical development. When we made the slides a few weeks ago, there was about 27. There were about 27 programs in uh, clinical testing and with even larger number in the preclinical testing. And some of those are um, listed here and what's what's well known is the Moderna and Pfizer's mRNA approach um, which is uh, it's a very fast technology um, but one should know that no one has ever produced an mRNA vaccine before so we'll see how well the mRNA vaccine turn out. What's also uh, another popular domain is using a non-replicating viral vector. AstraZeneca University Oxford program is like that. And, for, and you'll see many more using just old technology of doing inactivated virus. Um, that's, a, that's a popular domain. All those technologies, I would consider them as very fast vaccine development, but uh, the problem is they're fast, but they're not very effective. So, and I think what the, our, our approach in general to this is to get something that works out there and, uh, and uh, develop something that's better, um, which generally take longer time. So. so what's the advantage of the Lake Pharma COVID vaccine? One is, the number one thing is what we're doing is is called protein vaccines. And protein vaccines have excellent track record of success. They're not viruses. So they actually, compared to inactivated viruses, protein vaccines are very safe. And not only is it not a virus, it doesn't contain any portion of a virus. It doesn't even have a gene fragment of a virus. So the, the chance for one developing a virus infection from that's coming from a protein vaccine is zero because there's no virus there to start with. And the 
if you look at all the vaccines ever developed in the past many years, the two very best vaccines, the both are protein vaccines. One is hepatitis B vaccine, and the other one is hepatitis, uh, 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 human papillomavirus, HPV vaccines. So the two best vaccines are protein vaccines that give us the confidence of the protein vaccines, the right way to go, even though they take longer time to develop. Another advantage of our vaccines that we focus on a particular domain of the, uh, the spike protein versus using the full length spike protein. And we believe that's a better way to do because one, it will induce a stronger immune response and two, it minimizes the safety risk of uh, something called ADE, that stands for antibody dependent enhancement. And that's where when ADE happens, um, the vaccine could actually make things worse versus better. So we believe by going with RBD, we minimize the risk of ADE, whereas ADE is, a, is, is actually a real risk for the full length spike protein as vaccines. Something that we should all be paying attention to and uh, most of the front running, the current uh, most advanced vaccine programs, most of them are actually using the full length spike protein. So we could be seeing uh, reports of ADE uh, you know, in the next few months. And if so, that's a very serious problem because the, in those cases, vaccines make things worse, not better. Um, and uh, the, our vaccine, the Lake Pharma COVID vaccines are, uh, the adjuvants we use are very safe adjuvants and have excellent safety record. And in our case, because we're using proteins, the stability and the formulations uh, actually look really good. And we believe we could actually make this um, and, and the material does not actually require cold chain, meaning storage of the samples uh, in, the, in, the, in the cold chain environment. So further, we use a chill based manufacturing process and it's a it's the it's probably the most robust manufacturing process that biotech industry had has developed and our our proteins can be frozen or lyophilized and uh, and there's potential for intranasal and inhalation administration so i am towards the end of my presentation but i do want to tell you uh, i do want to talk about the inhalation or intranasal application so everything i've shown you so far is our protein vaccine LP151, uh, but we've been busy developing a second generation vaccine, and this one is called LP635, and it's a protein nanoparticle vaccine. Uh, this is the only slide that we're gonna share on the protein nanoparticle vaccine because we still have very active work ongoing. And the protein nanoparticle, it's a very cool area of technology development. Perhaps there's some folks in UT Dallas are doing this too, but protein nanoparticles are much harder to make, but if you can make them, they have tremendous advantage in, uh, in as a vaccine because they're generally more immunogenic uh, than proteins because our immune system is, is more, uh, is better at recognizing viruses than proteins. So a nanoparticle would make our protein look more like viruses and therefore easy to detect by the immune system. So they tend to be more immunogenic and they have better potency and lower doses. And that's exactly what our data is showing here. When we compare our nanoparticle vaccine with, uh, with a protein vaccine, we saw that the at the same dose, we're seeing much better titer, earlier titer as well with the nanoparticle. And when we do the full dose response, we see that our nanoparticle vaccines is at least 10 times more potent than the protein vaccines, um, dose matched. Uh, so we're, we're very happy to see the second generation development. And, uh, and what's exciting about the vaccine is that um, it's, it's um, the intranasal administration of vaccine is has a, has good utility uh, in certain populations. And the nice thing about intranasal administration is that one, 
you may not need to have a needle poking through the muscle. Uh, it's not a needle. And, uh, and second is, is applying this to where the virus probably matter the most, which is the nasal cavity and as well as the rest of the respiratory uh, domains. And we there's one cell paper published by Washington University a few weeks ago that's showing really nice data of their uh, protein nanoparticle achieving uh, protective effect using intranasal administration. So ours are compared uh, similar to that. And uh, so we're, we're very excited about the potential for the intranasal administration. We have started, uh, we have done some animal studies and showing promising results uh, in our own hands that our, our protein nanoparticle can induce good immune response using intranasal administration so okay so that's really all the data uh and the story i want to share and my this is my last line i i do want to thank everyone for uh for attending this and uh, if you're interested in learning more about lake pharma uh, please visit our website lakepharma.com and we are we continue to hire and and uh and build uh, I'm based in Dallas, Texas, uh, and we're hiring more. Uh, we intend to build a larger operation here. So if you, and we have hired a number of project managers and scientific managers uh, in the local area. Um, in fact, I hired multiple people from UT uh, Southwestern in the past few months. So if uh, they're folks, whether undergrad, well, a bachelor's, or PhD graduates or postdocs, if you're interested in, please take a look at our career page. And my email is shown here. And if you want to contact me directly, please feel free to send me an email. And further, Lake Farm actually has a uh, has a record, has a history in collaboration with academic institutions. Lake Farm is an organization that actually published papers um, and. Uh, we have a number of scientific collaborations ongoing right now with uh, institutions that we've been working with for years. So perhaps there's an opportunity to collaborate with uh, UT Dallas and we would welcome that opportunity. So that's really all I have today. Thanks, for, thanks everyone for your uh, attendance today. Thank you, Thank Dr. Chu. Um, if you have a minute or two, we do have some questions in the queue. Okay. What is the alternative to testing in animal or mice models, and can a novel model human immune system be developed only using different cell types so this can be used for vaccine testing? Yeah, I would say I think the short answer is possibly. Possibly. I think the vaccine testing is pretty well established. And, you know, we have done this, and other companies have done a lot on that. And do we need to develop a newer way of testing vaccine for the SARS-CoV-2? Probably not, because a vaccine development is, is pretty clear as what other things that need to be done. So there may be utility in, in having animal models that behave more like humans, um, which could accelerate in some of the testing. Um, there could be interest. Very good, thank you. The next question is, what is the soonest you can generate a vaccine and then how much time until mass production? So it sounds like an estimated question. Um, yeah, so I would say the, the biggest bottleneck um, is, is the clinical trials and, and uh, Running clinical trials and working with FDA, uh, both are very um, uh, uh, processes that are necessary, but then they can be, uh, that can take a very long time. Okay. And this is probably the biggest bottleneck right now when it comes to uh, a vaccine development. Can a vaccine be developed really quickly? I believe so. But is our current process in this country allowing for that? No, it does not. So, and uh, I would say at this point, I'm confident that the biotech industry have already come up with solution. We're not the only one. 
but are they being used in, in people? No, there's been a tremendous amount of resources spending clinical trials and, and and for that. So, and that's why it's taking so long. So, and I think when the government say it takes you know a year, year and a half to do this, I don't think they mean the development of or making of such molecule. I'm not trivializing making of the molecule, but that time is really more on the clinical trials, the clinical studies to demonstrate the safety and efficacy of vaccine before they can be broadly utilized. So those take time. And uh, in certain countries, they may be faster. So as we know, Russia has already registered the first vaccine product. I do not believe the technology is any better. It's just that they're willing to move faster. Could that be, could could this be moved even even better, even more? I think there's an really an opportunity for improvement in how we test vaccines. How do we uh, move things quickly and responsibly? I think there's opportunity for that. Thank you for sharing your time, talent, and resources with the attendees and community at large, Dr. Tu. Registration and so much more can be found on the Office of Research webpage please visit research.utdallas.edu. Thank you and have a nice afternoon.